All right, so some, some of my wonderful friends and volunteers are gonna be passing out index cards. In addition to using the mic, we're gonna have the option if you want to write a question on an index card, I'll be taking questions that way as well because I understand not everybody is comfortable standing up and asking a question around sexuality. So keep an eye out for those, help pass them along. All right, if people need pens, we do have a few extra pens. Just raise your hand and we'll have someone go by and try to get you a pen. All right. Cool, so what are we doing? Uh, we're a little late. Well, all right, so. Yeah, we got some. Yeah. Am I trying to sign in? Yes. Yes, actually, please let me sign in. Is there a display foot on that? That's your laptop, right? That's my laptop. Right? Yep, let's plug this in. Out of the HDMI, I need a display foot. The other side. Drop it in, I got you. Plug in a couple wires and then we're good to go. Oh, come on. Okay, so the slides, the slides, the slides are ready to go whenever they're ready. Awesome. Uh, no, I don't. No. So the slides should be ready to go. there's something that needs to be pushed on that laptop to get it to talk to display?
I'll take that option too. We're in, we're, we're in America. Okay, cool. So it's not like part of my car. No, it's not your fault at all. You didn't break it. I mean, unless you want to be playing. Granted, I see a... Okay. I see a fairly full crowd. Now, as a reminder, this next talk is going to involve discussions of sex and sexuality. If you are not interested in hearing about this, and, and based on the size of the crowd, I'm guessing a lot of you are, um, we do have other talks going on. We invite you to check those out. We apologize for the technical difficulties. What? Things happen. Someone broke the power source on this. Yeah. Oh, for All right. Well, I mean, I can. We can. We can. I can talk for a while without slides. That's fine. perfect. Uh, just ignore me, and we'll get it going. Okay. <laughs> so. Our next speaker is deeply involved in sex education in, um, and is the founder of the Effing Foundation, a, a nonprofit focused on sex and sexuality. And I'd like to introduce Kit Stubbs. Thank you. Yay, thank you. All right, well thank you everybody so much for coming out on bright, bright in, the, in the morning on a Sunday at noon. I appreciate it. Um, so yay, welcome to, so this is, uh, I'm very grateful, this is my third HOPE talk. Um, so this is the Sex Geek Returns, Hacking and Human Sexuality, AMA, Ask Me Anything. So I'm Kit, uh, let's see, so we're gonna, we're gonna kinda go, we're, we're gonna get started without the slides and we'll kinda see how it goes, right? Um, after the talk, the slides and uh, other resources um, I'll try to put up, those will be at, on my personal blog at toymakerproject.com. Um, yeah, so a little bit about me. Um, we can talk more about this later if you like. Um, my name is Kit. I am non -bi my gender is non-binary. Um, I am queer, more specifically pansexual, and my pronouns are they, them, theirs. I do actually have a PhD in robotics from Carnegie Mellon. <laughs> Yay, shout out to my Carnegie Mellon friends who are here. Um, this is not exactly what I thought I would be doing with my PhD when I got it. Um, but I'm extremely thankful to have been able to move into a space uh, that I think is really important and fun. Um, I like to start with a privilege check, just acknowledging that like, I have a lot of privilege in being able to be here and speak with you, right? I'm white, I'm fairly well off, I have an advanced degree, um, you know, we're sitting on stolen indigenous land, I want to recognize that. Um, but yeah, so just want to acknowledge that and, and again, thank you all for taking the time to come out. So, as, as you may have noticed in the program, all right, this is actually so long I have to read off my slide. So, hi, I'm a queer, non-binary, disabled trans femme, originally from Missouri, who makes their own geeky sex toys and runs a sex-positive nonprofit. Ask me anything. Whoa, that's a lot, right? Okay, all right, so I wanted to try and offer the full sort of breadth of my experience um, and, and really, but so before we get in to start unpacking some of all that and some of the things we could talk about, I want to say, so what I'm trying to do is hold space for us to talk about sex. Because unfortunately, in this, in this country and in many places, we don't have opportunities just to kind of have ordinary conversations about sex and sort of people's experiences and answer questions. Like, we don't have that. And so I'm grateful to Hope for providing me the opportunity to sort of have, have this space with you all to have this kind of conversation. Um, the trick is we're gonna, we're gonna try to have this conversation without sexualizing me. And so it's really important that we kind of take a minute to talk about what that means so that we can kind of have this respectful and interesting conversation, right? So what I mean by sexualizing me is basically, or, or sexualizing someone, Shout out to Captain Awkward, <laughs> folks who, so this is basically sharing your pants feelings um, without consent from the person you're sharing them with. Pants feelings, many of us have them, not everybody, that's okay. Um, but you know, they're kind of a private and intimate thing. And, oh, oh, maybe we're gonna get slides now, that'd be super cool. Uh, maybe not, all right. So the thing about pants feelings, right? So if I'm at a con like this, and I'm giving a talk about sex or sex tech, which I do, and you come up to me after the talk, and you're like, great talk, 
cool, awesome, thank you, I appreciate that. Like, that's totally fine. Um, if you come up to me after the talk, oh, oh things are happening, and, and you say, oh, you're hot, Mm, that's pants feelings. That's rogue pants feelings. I didn't want to hear about that. We're not in that kind of relationship. Like, that requires, like, a level of intimacy and consent. Um, you know, so just no. No, that's not great. And in fact, it doesn't really matter if I'm standing up. Oh, hey, it's my slides. All right, so here's scumbag Steptagon, um, <laughs> who, is, who has approached me. I was like, oh, you're hot. Uh, oh God, that's Pants Felix, no. And in fact, it would still be just as awful if I were just like out in the grocery store. It doesn't even matter that I'm talking about sex. If I were just out in the grocery store and Septagon comes up and is like, you're hot. I'm like, oh God, no, that's Pants feelings. I did not consent to this. This is kind of gross. And it doesn't matter where it is, right? This is a level of intimacy with you and your Pants feelings that I have not consented to, right? I am not an object here for your sexual, like, for your sexual pleasure, right? I'm a human being. I have just as much right, yeah, thanks for the people, I hear the snaps, thank you. Um, yeah, actually, I'm not an object, right? I'm, yeah, no, no, just, just no, right? And so here's a real life example. I got this message on Facebook, May 25th of this year, please excuse my intrusion, and I really hope you don't mind me saying, considering you probably get messages like this all the time, but you are absolutely yummy, Rose Emoticon. Actually, no, I don't get messages like this all the time because most people <laughs> realize that sharing your pants feelings with someone you are not in a relationship with is gross. No, no, this is pants feelings. No, let's not, please. So here's the thing. The fact that someone talks about sex does not mean they have consented to receive your pants feelings. And in fact, the fact that someone exists or that you may find them attractive, does not mean they have consented to receive your pants feelings. Okay. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna hold some space to talk about sex, ideally without sexualizing me or anybody else. Awesome. Um, if you are also interested in sort of boundaries and the hacker community, go back and watch Gus's fabulous talk from yesterday, The Problem with the Hacker Mystique. So here, yeah. Yeah, I like 110% agree with everything Gus said her talk, it was great. So if you're sort of interested in these issues around sort of boundaries and consent and sex and how we talk about it, um, please go back and check out Gus's talk because um, it was fabulous. All right, now, so let's, let's dig into this a little bit so you can kind of hear about some of the things that I am happy to be asked about, right? I'm queer, um, what we can talk about, what that means. Um, it's, for me, more, it's, it's the sexual orientation of, in my case, like, I'm potentially attracted to other adult humans. Mm. Like, that's all I can say, right? Um, Non-binary is like, so if, if gender is a system in which there are, there are two options and it's like radio buttons and you only get to pick one, my gender is fudge that shit, like no, that's my gender. Um, and so I identify as trans because my gender now is not the same gender I was assigned at birth. Um, and I'm a femme because I'm a, I'm a femme, I don't know. My, my style often involves cute, traditionally feminine things. Um, and I love that. I'm, whoa, yeah. So things we can talk about are the difference between gender and genitals and sexual and romantic orientation, none of which are the same, none of which if you have one, can you predict another just by that one piece of information? Um, and really technically some folks are agender, don't do gender, you may be asexual, aromantic. Those are all things um, we can totally talk about if folks are interested. I'm disabled in particular. Um, I am disabled due to chronic illness. I have fibromyalgia syndrome, which is basically a condition that means uh, I, uh, I experience chronic pain and fatigue and I started having symptoms in 2004 in grad school. Uh, so how to navigate sex <laughs> with someone with a chronic illness. It's, it's a whole other thing. It's a different way of thinking about sex. Um, I also have mental illness. I have generalized anxiety disorder. I uh, have had partners who have had mental illness. So like that's something I can talk about. Um, I'm originally from Missouri, from a very conservative um, and religious family. Most of my family are Missouri Senate Lutherans. So they're not like the most, most conservative Lutherans, but they're like right up there. Um, and so the impact that that had on my sexuality and what it was like growing up are things I'm happy to talk about. I make my own geeky sex toys. 
Um, I've done some body casting. That is a clay copy of my friend Jimmy's penis on the left. I've made, you know, I've done stuff with Sugru, external use only. Um, that's a, the bottom is a Barbie scale glass dildo that I made at Artisan's Asylum, which was great. Um, this, was one, this was my first toy, the TARDIS Tickler. This is a copy of my favorite dildo with a tiny TARDIS suspended inside it. You may have seen it on the internet. It's dedicated to gender pioneer Kate Bornstein, who I love so dearly. Um, so the other thing, so if we can get the, the lights down for a sec. The other thing I have made, so I, lo I love this. I th saw this tweet go by lately the, from the AV Club. Let's settle it. What's in Pulp Fiction's glowing briefcase? And my dear friend, Alexandra Aaron, the woman who explains things on the internet, she's fabulous, um, said, ask for this nicely and they'll show you. Well, let's see, right? Glowing briefcase, can we see the glowing briefcase? What's in the glowing briefcase? It's my cock. <laughs> this is the hammer. This is an Arduino run. <laughs> Dildo, it's basically got a bunch of Adafruit Neo pixels in it, and it's connected to the like Arduino I happen to have around my house at the time. This was basically my first real electronics project. I took like the intro to Arduino class, and it was like, what am I gonna do? No idea. Two years later, oh. Like when you hang out in a makerspace with enough burners um, and you see LEDs everywhere, suddenly it's like, oh yeah, LEDs make everything better. Um, <laughs> right? They really do. So we can have lights back up now. So that is, uh, I, we can certainly talk about toy making. I've got various um, props and stuff. And, and after the talk, we can, we'll, if folks are interested, we'll find a space and I can show some of that. So we can totally talk about toy making. I run a sex positive nonprofit. I am indeed the founder and executive director of the Effing Foundation for Sex Positivity, EFFING.org. We are, no kidding, a 501c3 nonprofit. <laughs> Our mission is to reduce sexual shame, to normalize conversations around sex by fostering sex positive art and education. Um, this past, so since the, I was last here, we have awarded $40,000 in grants to eight projects across the United States. Thank you. Um, thank you to, there, there are some folks here in the audience who were donors to that campaign. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm happy to talk about those projects and what else we're doing. We're actually just launched our first public open call for projects. So if you go to effing.org slash grants, we are interested in hearing about people's sex positive projects for, for potential funding. So yay. Um, so the, the struggle of trying to get this nonprofit off the ground and it taking, oh gosh, like six years or so, <laughs> slow and steady. Um, but we got there. So I'm happy to talk about nuts and bolts of that. So this isn't ask me anything. This isn't ask me anything, you know, like re respectfully, like if, if you are, I understand that these issues can be really complicated and it's like, oh God, am I using the right language? Like if you're making an effort to be respectful, I will appreciate that and we'll like, we'll go from there. That's cool. Um, yeah, so at this point, if folks are, if you have a question and you are comfortable stepping up to the mic, now is a fine time to do that. Um, if you have a question on a card and you would like to, like, we can start kind of passing cards back if I can get a couple of my friends who help distribute the cards kind of run through. So, and if you just want, if you, you know, if you're not going to use your card, that's fine. You can pass it back. Um, so we'll kind of, we'll kind of see how this goes. I'm happy. Like I say, we'll answer. We'll kind of alternate between sort of cards, mic. Um, if we get to a lull, then we can have a, <laughs> have a shouting vote or something for like what we're, what I'm going to talk about. Like, you know, I'm flexible. So, so folks will be moving through the crowd if you get ideas on cards. And um, yeah, I think we've got someone at the mic. So go right ahead. So this is a question for you wearing your toy maker hat. Um, sure. What is the state of the art right now? Are, are there real advances being made? Because it's kind of an ancient... Uh, uh, technology um, that in its, its core basic uh, shapes haven't really changed for millions of years. Um, so I'm, I'm curious what developments are happening, what, what boundaries are being pushed in advancing that art. Oh, thank you. That's a great question. And before I answer that, just a reminder, this is being streamed live on the internet to everywhere. So if you are not comfortable having your voice on the recording, that's cool. Grab a card, like write it down, we'll, we'll make sure that, that you have that opportunity. So, thank you, so the question was, yeah, what is, what is the latest and greatest in terms of sex toys? Um, oh man, that is, a, uh, that is a really interesting question. So, 
Well, I'll tell you what's what's becoming really popular is sort of internet connected like Bluetooth enabled sex toys. And Renderman, who is here with Internet of Dongs, has been doing a lot of great research displaying the poor, 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 embarrassingly bad security on like pretty much all of these devices. So um, I think we are gonna keep seeing more of that. It would sure be nice if toy makers could actually like consider people's privacy and security <laughs> when building these. So if you wanna follow sort of where that is going, follow Renderman and Internet of Dongs. He's doing fabulous work. Um, I've enjoyed visiting with him very much. Um, let's see, the other, the other thing to watch out for um, I know, this is not like super like, you know, I don't know of any like super top secret amazing wow kind of kind of thing, um, but I am excited because you know what's coming up on August 17th? Teledildonics Liberation Day. There is a crappy, crappy patent on basically using a computer of any sort to control a sex toy that is expiring finally on August 17th. EFF, yeah, oh, uh. EFF has featured it on their stupid patents of the month because, oh my God. So a patent troll, a dude invented it, sold it to a patent troll, a patent troll sat on it, and so that's about to go away. So I predict that after Teledilonics Liberation Day, we will hopefully see a plethora of new and interesting ways to, to connect sex toys to phones, computers, through the internet, whatever, um, and then Renderman will tell us that there's no security and I'll be sad. <laughs> So that is, that is upcoming. And, and so I, I feel like we really have yet to see kind of the, all the really cool, interesting things that will happen. But thank you. Okay, next up, hello. Hi. Hi. Um, so my question is more from a sex education standpoint. Sure. Um, so kind of from one mentally ill person to an, an, another, I guess. Um, how do you navigate kind of either sex and romantic and, and committed relationships mm -hmm. to uh, whether they're monogamous or, or polyamorous or you know just straight up sexual relationships? How do you navigate that with with people who have mental illness and are aware of it but might not be in positions at a certain point to fully consent? Like, how do you... Yep. Yeah. Okay, thank you for the question. So that is, that is a big and tough question. I can, I can kind of only speak to part of it and then I will try to get some resources up. So the things that I can speak to as someone with mental illness and having partners with mental illness is a lot of it is sort of treating yourself and your partner with gentleness. And for me, it has meant sort of redefining sex so that it's not just penis and vagina. That's the only thing that counts. That's the only thing we're interested in. It's gotta have, there's gotta be an orgasm at the end, hopefully for, for everybody, if you're gonna do that. Um, to giving myself permission and the flexibility to say like, well, sexy times could be a lot of things. A lot of the things that we consider foreplay, like they don't really count. Oh God, I hate that, I hate that so much. Um, those, those can count, right? Are you having sort of, you're, you're having this intimacy, Hopefully people are enjoying themselves. Like, so I kind of give myself permission for whatever I'm feeling up for that day that like, that's okay, you know? And being with partners and being like, well, what are you up for, you know? Is there any, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's like kind of mutual masturbation. Like we're side by side and we're just like each kind of on our own bodies, but we like get to enjoy the vibe because the other person's having, like there's so many things you can do. And so like in terms of that way, like just being open and like giving yourself permission not to focus on one particular act, um, I have found to, to be really fulfilling and empowering. Um, now, in terms of issues around consent, so here, the thing that you are gonna wanna potentially Google is like trauma-informed, um, like sex education. That is an area that I can't speak to as much. What you So there are folks who have experienced various trauma, um, sexual violence, um, complex PTSD, like there are lots of things that can actually make it very difficult for a person to really be able to say no. And that's really tricky stuff. Um, what, so my, in talking with some of those folks, you, you get into issues of like, can you be sen being sensitive to partners and sort of like, um, 
rec like a lot of it is just recognizing that that's the case and then sort of trying to figure out are there other ways that, that you can communicate. Um, so that is a whole other school that I have not, that I don't have personal experience with, but I will try to put up some resources because there certainly are folks who talk more explicitly about that. But yay, thanks for the question. All right, um, have we gotten any cards? I assume, okay, friends, friends with cards. <laughs> if, if I, they will eventually make their way to me. In the meantime, um, yeah, we'll take another question for the mic. Hello. Hello there. Uh, my, my question was originally going to be about the, uh, the Teledildonics Liberation Day. I am so glad to hear that that's finally going to expire. Yes. Have you had any other experience with that sort of thing, with patent trolls or also oh. with the, with the uh, Think Foundation, any sort of weird legal issues specifically related to? Yeah, thank it's you for asking. Sexy. So, me personally, when I first introduced the hammer, so the hammer is a prototype, 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 so many wires. Um, <laughs> it's like my warning, because people are like, oh, when can I get one? I'm like, ah, oh, there's one that exists. You have seen it. I have no manufacturing experience. Uh, but when I first introduced that, so that, and I've, I've tried to be very open about this, that, because I have no sculpting skill, this prototype is a copy of an existing toy. And I got basically a cease and desist and some very angry, like angry lawyer grams. I was like, oh, stop what you're doing. And it's like, give us all your, like, cause I had um, a list of folks, like for a while I collected email addresses of folks who may, might be interested in getting one. Could I ever get them manufactured? And they're like, you have to give us that list. It was like, <laughs> me and my lawyer were like, no. <laughs> like, I'm not selling anything. This is prototype proof of concept. Like, go away. And, you know, we said that back and, yeah, they, they went away. But, like, I have had other friends. Um, some friends of mine were doing an open source vibrator and, you know, crowdfunded and um, an, an open source kind of programmable vibrator. And they got sued, like them and, a, and some other kind of small, small manufacturers got sued by the patent troll. Um, and basically in the end, they were able to get some help through EFF for some pro bono representation. In the end, they basically had like, it basically killed their, their open source sex toy startup. Like the, the time and energy and like, yeah, no, we can't afford to like, they wanted, you know, so many dollars a toy and it's like, well, no. <laughs> So that's been really annoying. Um, in terms of the foundation, one of the reasons why it took me so long to get this going was finding payment processing. Because as soon as you tell people in finance you wanna do anything around sex, all they hear is like, oh God, sex, no. Um, no, seriously, like, they are like, what? You know, it's considered high risk. Um, so I am particularly concerned. And so if folks aren't following FOSTA SESTA, um, you should go watch Maggie Mayhem's talk from, from This Hope on Friday. Um, and one of the things she talks about is there is now upcoming, so that the, the, the thing with FOSTA SESTA is it's, an, it's basically, it's internet censorship, targeting sex workers, harming sex workers in the guise of preventing human trafficking, and it's, it's bullshit. And we can go into that, like, you can read all about that. It's bullshit. EFF and Woodhull fortunately have, are trying to get an injunction filed to stop it. Um, but now upcoming, so in addition to, to censorship and websites being shut down, we have the, there's, it's like a stop, it's, there's, a, there's a bill to stop banking services to human traffickers, and like that has the potential to screw organizations, not, not just sex workers, who would you like them to get out of sex work? You know, being able to say, have banking services and establish a credit score if they wanted to leave, boy, that would sure be helpful, wouldn't it? Um, but organizations like mine that focus around sexuality, now I have to worry, is that, is that gonna come from my organization? Because it took me so long to get payment processing and now it's like, great, this bill is coming up. Um, so yeah, that's some of the bullshit that I've, we've had to deal with. Not fun. All right, have we got, oh, we may have a question from the crowd. Cool. All right. Okay. All right, this is kind of a long question, uh, but that's all right, we will take it piece by piece. When someone like yourself appears to be a female, quote unquote, how does one know how to correctly refer to another person, he, she, et cetera? Would you suggesting every person, asking every person what they prefer, even a salesman or store associate, wouldn't that be a little overwhelming to think you had to do that with every person you met? Whew, okay, and then there's another part. All right, so I under, like, yeah, I, I do present very feminine, yep. So what, so here's the thing, right? Every person has a name, and if you're interested in like establishing a relationship or even interacting politely with that person, like that's kind of a thing 
you at least acknowledge, try to use, you know, you maybe try to remember, it's kind of imperfect, but you try, right? Pronouns are actually a lot like that, right? Everybody has pronouns that they use. Um, and so if you want to, so, so if you want to like, you're meeting a new person, um, often you can, you can lead with your own pronouns to like let people know you're kind of, you're hip to that. And then if they're comfortable, they'll tell you back. Many of us, like if you, if you politely ask, what are your pronouns? We're like, oh yeah, they, them, or he, she, you know, he, his, or whatever. And like, that's fine. Um, usually, so if we're, if we're talking about salesmen or store associates, whatever, whatever, um, if I need to refer to them, often I can just, if I can, I, you know, I, and I'm not perfect about this either, but I strive to use gender neutral language. Like, oh yeah, that person over there with like the long blonde hair, you know, they, they helped get my order, whatever. Like, oh yeah, I think our server is the server over there, you know, with the, the long yellow skirt, like whatever. Okay. Like, so if you, if you tend to default to gender neutral language, you don't really have to stress out about asking each and every person their pronouns. Um, it's more of a thing like if, if you're like getting, to, like getting to know a colleague or a potential friend, like that can be a nice thing. Um, and am I offended when a stranger calls me she? It's, I notice, <laughs> offended. It's kind of like, hmm, I'm a little sad. Um, how can we not be offensive, but also not ask every person we ever meet? So yeah, no, you don't have to ask every person you ever meet. Um, it's more important if this is like someone you may be, again, kind of establishing a relationship. You're meeting a friend at a, you know, meeting someone at a party or whatever, like sales, sales clerks and associates and whatever, just, you know, use your gender, gender new language. So yeah, I, am I offended? No, depending on my level of energy, I will try to correct the person. Do I try to correct every salesperson and store clerk and whatever? No, because that's freaking exhausting to try and explain, okay, so gender is this construct and it's really this whole space. It's not just two points. Like, I don't have the time and energy to like sit down with literally every person and like have that conversation. So what's cool is when other people start to educate themselves about how gender works and are sort of aware that like, you know, gender neutral language, so handy. Like that can totally be a thing you use to so just be aware. Hey, if you're introducing yourself to someone new with your name, maybe add in your pronouns. Like, hey, you know, I'm Jim. I use he, him. Cool. And then, and if someone explicitly tells you their pronouns, you do your best to use them. Um, I will say if you mess up, the, honestly, the best thing to do is just correct yourself and keep going. So if, if I'm sitting at a table and someone looks over and it says, oh yeah, referring to me, yeah, she makes sex toys, I'd be like, they. Honestly, don't make, you don't have to make a big deal, just be like, oh, sorry. Yeah, they make sex toys. Awesome, that's so great. I don't need a profound apology. Like, it, that's also exhausting. <laughs> just like, oh, acknowledge and correct and like move on, and that's cool. So yeah, like no, you don't, you know, just, just be aware, you know, just be aware when, when pronoun, like when you have established someone's pronouns, use them or their name, use it. Awesome. And if not, maybe you can use some gender neutral language, like cool. So I, I appreciate that you're thinking about this. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, honestly, like the burden of having to exist in a trans, in, in a world that is trans antagonistic where people don't really think you exist, that's a lot of a burden. Like, and I feel like cisgender folks can like at least, you know, be aware, try to use gender neutral language, respect names and pronouns. I feel like that's not asking too much for trans people to be able to exist and survive. Thank you. But so thank you for the question and, and starting to engage with these things. Awesome. All right, let's do one from the mic and then we'll do another from a card. Yes, hello. Okay, um, excellent. I, um, I have kind of a strange question regarding sex education. Okay. It is, what does celibacy exactly have in the sex positive movement? What I'm talking about is a willing, voluntary abstention from sex, even though one may be sexual. I'm not talking about like asexuality, which is obviously yeah. not a choice. I'm talking about like celibacy as a choice. Um, so for me and my sex positivity, I'm like, that's awesome. To me, sex positivity is you get to establish whatever relationship to sex that you want. So that's great. I'm like, yeah. So I mean, I have friends who are ace and who are sex positive. So it's like, yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say, yeah, everybody needs to have more sex. Some people will say that, like, oh, more sex for everybody. I'm like, no, no, you know, consenting, like, pleasure-based, like, well-communicated sex for the folks who want that and their partners. <laughs> 
So yeah, like you can absolutely be sex positive and be celibate. You can be asexual. You can be like, yeah, it's just what we're trying to do is respect people's ownership of their own bodies. And that, you know, and so that can be a lot of things. And that's cool. Great question. Thank you so much. All right, I'm going to take one from a card and then we'll get you at the mic. Okay. Oh, this is a good question. I may not be able to answer, but I'll try. So in terms of disability, there has not been a lot of medical research around vulvular vestibulitis and pain pleasure for folks with vulvas. Um, are there advancements in the sex toy industry that take things like this into consideration? Oh, that is a really great question. So vulvular vestibulitis is an issue um, and I was diagnosed with this at one point um, for like sort of experiencing a lot of pain sort of around the vulva. So that can make intercourse painful. Um, no fun if you're into like penetrative intercourse, that sucks. Um, yeah, so unfortunately I am not aware of anything in the industry right now that explicitly takes that into consideration. Um, but like free idea, <laughs> like, yeah, no, we absolutely need more research around um, particularly folks with vulvas and because that's been so neglected for such a long time. Thanks, patriarchy. Um, so yeah, I will keep an eye out for that. And if I, if I like, I'll try to post if I, if I can find anything about that. But unfortunately, off the top of my head, I don't, I don't know that I do. Good question, thank you. Um, next at the mic. Yeah, so your Arduino project with the, the glowing dildo. Yeah. Was it hard to put the LEDs into the dildo? And if one yeah. LED were to break, would it be hard to replace them? Thank you. That's a great question. So the question was, on the hammer, the glowing dildo, how do, I, yeah, how do you get the LEDs in there? And if they break, are you just screwed? Um, so, so shout out to Jimmy P. Rogers. Uh, frequent Hope attendee, not, not this time, unfortunately, who helped me design this. So we've got inside here, um, and later after the talk, when maybe we'll do show and tell, I can show you some of this, there is a clear PVC tube. So this was cast just with a, an empty tube in it. And then we basically, slide. we can slide the LEDs in and out. There's like these rows of pixels. So if we do need to repair or replace the LEDs, we could. At this point, honestly, um, really, the the problem is just in the the cable, like these these connections and these solder connections, like getting broken. So, like the LEDs themselves have been doing fine, yay. So I don't think we're gonna have to redo that. I'm gonna have to redo this connection at some point. Um, but yeah, so my fir the first version of this prototype, the LEDs were cast directly into the silicone, and then unfortunately, what happened was as the silicone flexed, the components on the LED strip started to pop off. So thus we learned, like use use a tube or something in there to kind of protect your electronics. Great question. All right, let me get another one from the audience. <clears throat> what have we got? Oh, okay. This is, this is an interesting question. What's your opinion on real dolls? Do they devalue people? So real dolls are like attempting to be realistic, very realistic human like sex toys, they're basically, they're basically giant human-shaped sex toys. Um, you can get both sort of femme models with vaginas and buttholes and mouths that you can insert penises into. You can also get sex dolls um, that are like dude looking and you know, like more traditionally masculine looking and have penises. Um, they're made of silicone at this point, like, there are folks who are starting to look into sort of roboticizing them and trying to give them some sort of sensing um, and actuation. So, so here's, here's my thing about this, right? To me, a real doll is really just, it's, it's a sex toy. It's a toy. It's not, so here's the thing, right? It's much like, much like porn, right? If you're only getting information about sex and your education about sex from, say, playing with a real doll or watching mainstream porn, that's not good. Like if that's the only information you have about sort of how sex works and like how to communicate with a partner, that's really not great. Um, and so my kind of take on this is, well, what we need is sort of, you know, fact-based, consent-based, pleasure-based, queer and trans inclusive sex education, age appropriate provided at like all ages. <laughs> so. If you get people, like if we actually teach people things about sort of 
relationships, respecting boundaries, like how body parts work, like things like that from like age appropriately from a young age, then we've actually given people all the tools they need. And if they want, you know, and then if you want to go out and get a real doll or whatever, or you're going to watch porn, you're at least aware of like, you have good information and you can make choices about sort of what you watch, what you use, what you take away from it, right? I have asked people like, oh, if we make, if we make, you know, well, but what about like, sex androids that are just like, you know, it's like replicants or something. They're like, just like people, but you can have sex with them, but they're robots. And I'm just like, okay. Honestly, so as a roboticist, I can tell you, I don't think we're gonna see that within my lifetime. Like people, <laughs> sex is like, sex is so physical and it's messy and there's fluids and like all this physics and like, you're gonna get a robot to do what now? And like, <laughs> like really, like, you know, body, you're like there's a lot you can do with a body. Um, you want a robot to do what? And like all these fluids and like what? And, and then you're gonna wanna have it interact with someone in a like believable, like, nah. <laughs> tell you what, tell you what, if such a thing is made, you know, and I'm gonna be like in my 90s or whatever, you send me one, I'll test it out. <laughs> but no, so, so really my take is, right, I don't feel that real dolls or porn, for that matter, like devalue people, but what I think is that they are bad examples if that's all you have. And so providing education is really what we need. And then, yeah, like, I don't know, that's my take. Cool, thank you. All right, back to the mic. Um, yeah. Uh, could one claim fair use for making a smart version of, say, bad dragon gear? Hmm, okay. Could one claim fair use for making a smart version? Okay, so I'm not a lawyer. I actually have a friend who is nearby, and maybe if he's really nice, we later we can ask him about this. Um, my understanding, my limited understanding, is that the design of a sex toy is a copyright thing, mm -hmm. and so you're kind of stuck uh, because copyright. Um, so... If this is something that you're just gonna like, I mean, okay, again, not a lawyer, <laughs> not a lawyer, not, 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 not a lawyer. Um, you know, if this is something that you're gonna just, you're gonna take a toy at home and do, and like play around with your friends, that's probably not a big deal. If you're gonna put it on the internet, they may get grumpy. If you're gonna sell it, they're gonna get really grumpy. So, you know, um, but yeah, so that's, unfortunately, that's not much more I can say about that. Um, just be aware. Thank you. Oh, sorry. So Bad Dragon is a company that makes fantasy-inspired dildos and sex toys, like dragon penises, reptile, reptilian penises, werewolf penises. Like, if you've ever seen it in speculative fiction, it's there. It probably has a penis or a pussy, and you can buy it. Like, <laughs> that's their thing. You know, and I'm like, that's cool. Like, hey, you know, like, may not be my thing, but like, okay. Like, sure. So... Um, let's see. Okay, I don't more. Okay, cool. Uh, let me get this card and then we'll go back to the floor. Can I comment on Fitbit, et cetera, and sexual privacy implications? Um, I haven't done a ton of work in this area. So basically, I mean, off the top of my head, right, what I can say is if you have a device and you have consented you know, to, for your information to be sent back to a company for whatever, whatever, like, the, like, if there are things that can be deduced about your sexual activity and they want to, like, try doing some crunching and some correlation, like, yeah, it can happen. Um, I'd say Fitbit, I'm not as aware as much of this. So this you're going to want to see Renderman's work um, because he's, like, looked at. So the Wii Vibe, there was a big lawsuit over the Wii Vibe one of their models because they basically had copy pasted their privacy policy from their website to their app, which didn't like, doesn't make sense. So they were like, so yeah, they would have information about like when you turn the vibrator on, like how long you used it for, the internal temperature of the chip inside, like all this stuff. So like, yeah, like it's absolutely an issue. And so, when, if, especially if you are going to get a net connected toy, like you have to figure out like what what actually are they collecting on, on like what are they collect like what are you giving them permission to collect, um, and then because yeah it absolutely has sexual privacy implications. Oh, oh. 
okay. Um, oh, actually, I don't know how we got to the last slide anyway, but at some point I'll thank people. Um, how are we doing time-wise? I don't know where my phone went. Oh, okay, so we're in there. Um, all right, so real quick, next one from the floor. Um, so as we know, there's some pretty horrible people out there. I'm just curious, as someone who's pretty public on the internet, how much harassment do you get from like the incels and the various other usual suspects? Sigh. So, well, <laughs> not nearly as much as many other people I know in this space. Um, now, folks are gonna see this and they're like, oh, it's not getting any harassment, let's go harass Kit. Uh, jerk, like you're gonna be a jerk, I guess. But so for like, I, I get the kind of like pants feelings, random pants feelings messages every so often. I did, there was a gentleman from uh, somewhere in Africa who sent me a whole bunch of dick pics and said, can you please make a dildo shaped like my dick? <laughs> and so like, I was like, hey, just so you know, like this is, this is not appropriate, you know, and he apologized and like, all right, that's cool. Um, so, unfortunately, like, I am not, for whatever reason, yet, well, that's the thing, though, I expect, like, forecast, forecast, in the future, a lot more bullshit, um, will be coming in, right, because what I tell people, especially with the Effing Foundation, is if in five years we haven't pissed a lot of people off, something has gone horribly wrong, <laughs> like, frankly, um, so, yeah, fortunately, at this point, for me, it's been fairly low-key, certainly not the case, unfortunately, for a lot of other educators, especially, like, queer and trans educators in the space and artists, it's awful. Thank you for asking. Um, oh, recommendations for queer consent focused porn. Yes, yes, that is a thing I can do. Um, off the top of my head, and this is gonna be like, I'm apologizing in advance to like, cause I'm not gonna be able to name everybody. Uh, off the top of my head, Shine Louise Houston of Pink and White Productions does amazing queer consent focused porn. Um, the Effing Foundation is executive producer of a film called Open Paren, Close Paren, <laughs> pronounced whole. I'm like, oh, my list part. Um, that will be premiering in New York at the Invisible Dog, uh, which is like an art space in January. Um, so a little while away, but like that, that will be coming out. And I will try to link to some more. Um, also, oh, also if you like erotic comics, I highly recommend uh, The Smut Peddler. There have been a couple of volumes of that, and that is amazing. It is like drawn by queer and trans artists, all body shapes, sizes, configurations, like all like consent-based and really happy stuff. Um, so definitely recommend that as well. Back over to the mic. Hi, um, sex education question for you. Sure. Um, I was wondering what you see as the biggest um, gaps or areas for improvement in the current state of like the whole sex education landscape, and then also what um, what average lay people who may not do that as a full-time thing can do to improve the situation. Thank you. Yeah, you see my face. I have no poker face. It's like, where are the guests? And I'm like, ah, it's awful. It's awful almost everywhere. Um, if, and actually, if you're interested in this, there's a film called Sex Ed the Movie, which is a documentary about the history of sex ed films and kind of sex education in the US that is kind of depressing, but also kind of funny, <laughs> um, and a really great way to kind of get perspective on sort of what we have said about sex over time. Um, in terms of your, your, your you know, yeah, you're, you're not an educator, part of it is in the school district where you live, like see if you can find out what kind of curriculum the students are learning, and then like can you start talking to elected representatives, to school board members, and start pushing for better, better curricula. And I don't, off the top of my head, the only thing that, that like, the, the curriculum name that I know is OWL, Our Whole Lives, that was developed by the Unitarian Universalist Church, um, that they, they run that curriculum. So if you have, like, small people that, you know, you want to help them get good education and that program is available, I recommend it. Um, yeah, I'll see if I can get some more resources. But, but yeah, so some of it is just, like, knowing what, like, schools are doing, advocating for good education. If you have kids or... Um, are like kid adjacent, like you're kind of like, you know, you have friends with kids and they are looking, you know, you can try to help find resources. Sex positive parenting is what you're looking for. Um, you know, help, help those if they, you know, for folks who want to kind of give their kids good information, there are resources to help you or other folks do that. So that is all the time we have. Thanks to everybody at Hope for having me and thank you for coming out. I really appreciate it.
All right, so I'm going to gather all my stuff and head out sort of back in the hallway. So folks have questions or want to see stuff, we'll find a space. Yeah, people, if you have blank cards, if you can bring them back to the front uh, real quick, that would be a huge help. Put the penis in the thing. Now, where is my actual clicker? I probably did. Where's in my case? Clicker. Yeah, I'm, the, I'm around the rest of the con. Ah, there it is. Found it. <laughs> 